Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. As many of us start approaching midlife and beyond, we realize that our life has many experiences that we have yet to share with the world. Sometimes they seem to be our own little secrets, but it's always good to pass this knowledge on. One way that a person can do that is simply by just writing a memoir. Now, it's amazing what this can do because it can not only have neat implications on sharing how you dealt with circumstances such as change, maybe such as loss, but also great experiences such as gaining and and having successes as well as failures. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is a very well-worldly traveled guest who's been on our program once before, and he's here to talk about his book, Write Your Memoir, The Soul Work of Telling Your Story. And I'd like to welcome to our program Dr. Alan Hunter. Dr. Hunter, how are you doing these days? Extremely well, Daniel. It's great to be back on your program. You bet. Now, writing a memoir, most people wouldn't think about that. They probably would think, well, you know, that's something that movie stars or, you know, big people Mm -hmm. do. But generally, a memoir, I found, when you tend to find ones about people that you may not know much about, is very rich not only in life story and experience itself, but also offers a lot of insights that a lot of us could really use. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, a lot of people do assume that, you know, unless you are a, a major sports star or, you know, you've met Elvis or something, that uh, a memoir is something that's out of their league. But actually, it, it's not. A memoir doesn't have to be a whole life. It can be a portion of a life. It can even be, in some very famous cases, uh, just a couple of days when people learn something of really important that they wish to communicate and whether you're aiming for you know publication or whether as many of my my classes uh, uh, indicate whether you're just aiming towards letting a few people know what your experiences have been it can be enormously life enhancing to be able to say look this is what I saw this is what I did and here's some of the wisdom that came my way so your know, memoir is really a wonderful way, it seems to me, of of taking hold of one's life and giving it a, a good shake and finding out really the deep structures of what you know. Now, the beauty about what you talk about here, especially in your book, is that you try to engage writers to enlist their strongest ally, which is their unconscious, yes. in order to get them writing about meaningful things. What do you exactly mean by that? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, well, the unconscious is actually the, the, the biggest part of ourselves. I mean, psychologists say that about 90% or possibly more of what we do is dictated by our unconscious. Uh, you know, ask, ask anyone who's got off a plane in a different time zone and their, their unconscious is telling them to be hungry at the wrong times. Um, well, in some ways, that's a great ally if we wish to tap into the deep stories that we have to tell. And one of the best things you can do is set up um, you know, a writing practice, which means turning up uh, at your table or your desk or your laptop or your favorite cafe just for 15 minutes, but doing it each day and usually at the same time each day, maybe five days a week or four days a week, and gradually you train your own mind to recognize, oh, it's, it's okay to write about these things. It's really, you know, it's really acceptable to be able to take the time to put this down. And, and when we do that, my writers in my groups tell me that, uh, you know, not surprisingly, like athletes who are, who are training, they discover that they've been writing in their heads for the previous 24 hours, and when they turn mm. up at the table uh, with their pencil poised or, or their laptop open, they find that the information is just ready to, to pour out of them. And they stand back and say, wow, I didn't realize that was there. And that's what I mean when I say enlisting the help of your, your strongest ally, which is your unconscious self, and your unconscious self is really eager to tell these stories, it's just nobody's bothered to ask it before. <laughs> I know we've done uh, a few different shows, and we, especially when it comes to uh, subjects such as people trying to create more wealth, you know, in their life, whether it's their mm-hmm. finances or uh, starting a business or having a new partnership with someone else and and the like. And 
And so when they go and they pick up books to show and tell them how to do these things, call them, you know, self-help, if you will, they tend not to be successful even though they do everything these books tell them to. And the consistent subject that comes up about that is that their unconscious mind doesn't allow them to do this. I can see how doing what you're talking about would unlock a lot of those kinds of things and you'd realize the kinds of blocks and barriers you've created in your life due to some trauma or loss that you may have had, then you start writing this down and it comes out. That must be very refreshing. Well, it is. It's very refreshing. And sometimes, as I say, writers are uh, surprised and even astonished. And uh, I say, I have to say to them, you know, at a certain point, I say, you're in the flow. And, mm-hmm. you know, your unconscious is telling you things that you you perhaps have been pushing down all the time. I say, watch out when you're driving, (laughs) Mm -hmm. because stories and memories will pop into one's mind when we're driving. And that's because the conscious mind is engaged in in going down the road, and suddenly the unconscious says, oh, here's a good one. And when we get to that point, we literally are giving ourselves permission to know what we know. So your your comparison to the self-help books that tell you how to change um, things about uh, your life, your your comparison is entirely apt and correct because in some ways we're in a culture where people are not encouraged to speak, really speak, or, or write about what is closest to their hearts. And we have to give ourselves permission. And this is one of the things that I approach in the book with many techniques, and they're all road-tested. I've been teaching this stuff for, for decades now. They're, they're all techniques that work in order to break free of an usual mindset and enter a different mindset that says, okay, I'm going to look at what I can examine here with fresh eyes. So that's what that's Freddie Mercury and Queen were singing about in Break Free. <laughs> 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 Validation, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I always found it interesting. I watched a documentary on Queen first person, mm-hmm. and they were down in Rio de Janeiro, and the uh, radio or television host kept asking if that was a song about homosexuality. He says, no, it's just a song that Brian wrote. You know, but she kept at it. She says, "Look, he says, look, I'm trying to help you here." You know, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's quite interesting when you uh, have shared these techniques. When people uh, read, write your memoir, and we talk about how we're uncovering or the unconscious begins to tell its story. That you're really also talking about your soul story as well. What have people actually expressed to you in in experiencing this? Mm. Well, um, the the soul. Uh, aspect, the soul work, which appears in the title, it's, uh, it was actually contributed because we were talking in several classes with uh, various different writers, and we came to the conclusion that the writing they were doing was reaching further and asking questions such that they could, perhaps for the first time, begin to appreciate things that had seemed out of reach before. And so, you know, the classes agreed, oh, this isn't just writing, this is soul work, because they felt themselves change. And mm-hmm. they felt themselves change uh, because maybe they were writing about a, a parent or a sibling or something. And by being able to ask open-ended questions about what happened that day, uh, did it really happen the way I think it happened? Um, by beginning to ask those questions, they were able to see that there might be a second side to the story that perhaps they'd never, they'd never even thought about before. And this is, uh, you know, this is what we do, what people do. We see something, we, we think it is whatever it is, and we come to a conclusion very rapidly. And we may hold that conclusion for most of our lives, only to discover that really we've come to a conclusion based only on a tiny piece of the evidence. And that tiny piece of the evidence might be right so far as it goes, but what about the other side? Mm-hmm. You know, was was that uncle really such um, a miserable figure? Or was there something else going on so that we can understand the situation differently? Was one's parent really that difficult 
And if so, what were the reasons for one's parent to be difficult? Mm -hmm. And to what extent might we be still like them? So these are the sorts of questions that lead to this, what I call the soul work, because when we do it, we expand our, our real wisdom and our real compassion about the world we live in. And those that perhaps we wanted to condemn, we discover we can't condemn because they're, they're all together rather too close to who we are. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, that's important. Now, that just if I could build on that, I will say that many of the writers who've been through my classes um, and through my workshops have said that as a result of doing what they've done, they've come to a place of peace, real peace, with some often traumatic and difficult and ugly material. Mm -hmm. And that, you see, that I think is the, the deepest version of soul work. I well, this is an opportunity that a person can actually take rather than spending, say, thousands of dollars on therapy. They can actually sort of become their own therapist. Precisely, precisely. Now, you know, if if you need therapy as well, <laughs> don't, uh, too, don't yeah. let me talk you out of it, uh, I say to my, my folks. But actually a lot of work, uh, really a lot of work can be done in this way, using the writing to slow down the thought processes and ask, is that really the way it was? What happened next? And, you know, I know this because one of my books is... Um, uh, actually, my father's memoir, which he, he died and left me to complete, um, of his World War II experiences. Uh, and uh, it's called From Coastal Command to Captivity. And over the course of 50 years, he would not talk about those events. And during the, the eight, nine years in which he and I worked together, he really did come to a place of greater peace. I mean, he no longer woke up in the middle of the night shouting, don't shoot, uh, and things of that sort. And he came to a place of wisdom about what had happened to him. You know, there's a man who would never in a million years have gone to therapy, <laughs> even if he'd, right. if he'd been, been taken there with his arm twisted behind his back. But he was able to do this for himself, you see. Um, and that was the great gift that uh, that he was able to access his own wisdom. Now, um, that doesn't also have to be all about trauma. Tell us about experiences no. people share that also can be just as healing, although they were positive. Yes. Um, well, trauma is you know, loosely loosely defined. Obviously, the most dramatic things tend to be traumatic, but often people find they, that they say to them themselves in the classes, oh, you know, I really don't have very much to say about my life. It was, it was just rather a gentle life. And I say, oh, well, you know, A, you're very lucky, and B, um, maybe that gentleness is something to be treasured and even uh, communicated to everyone else. And so, you know, it's, one doesn't have to have gone to hell and come back <laughs> scarred in order to do the soul work. Sometimes this appreciation of the beauties of the life that one has been given have been um, enormously enlivening for my writers. Whether it's a, a memoir of growing up in rural western Massachusetts, which is what one lady was writing about, and it was a series of beautiful little vignettes of kids running around the farmyard and, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, little stories, which you thought at first, oh, these are little, and then you realized, oh, what she's doing here is she's giving us a whole view of a different time and another time, actually a rather peaceful and lovely time. And that, you see, that was the great gift that she had to offer there. Now, what about writer's block? I know you talk about uh, that, and people may get concerned. They're cruising along. The soul's really beginning to chatter away. They're feeling good about it, and all of a sudden they get stuck. Yes, yes. Mm. Well, uh, I, I take a very positive view of writer's block, and that is, um, you know, a, a block is something that stops you going where you really want to go. And many people say, oh, you know, writer's block is like the flu. You know, you just have to suffer. <laughs> I say, no, 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 it's a, it's a blockage. It's stopping you going where you want to go. Okay, what, 
what might be the problem here? And, you know, obviously everybody has their own version of this, but, but usually it, um, it's referring to things that people feel they're not allowed to talk about or that it would be somehow impolite to talk about or, oh, what if my mother read this or my aunt read this? Oh, they wouldn't like it. Mm -hmm. and, and if that's the case, <laughs> uh, then my thought is, oh, great. Well, now you're learning something about the sort of family you grew up in that maybe was more interested in being polite and quiet and shutting you up than it was about actually expressing thoughts and feelings that were really being felt. And so, you know, once we see writer's block not as a as a problem, but actually as the the outside of a treasure chest that we have to jimmy open, mm -hmm. uh, then it becomes a whole different uh, consideration. Now, there's a term that you use where you tell the writer how it needs to be written, and that is a phrase that a, a story will often do. Uh, when a person approaches that point, do you just kind of let it out? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, perhaps I can, I can answer that in a slightly different way, and that is um, in the book I have a large number of, of writing prompts and little techniques and exercises together with you know the, the sorts of responses one is likely to get. And um, what happens again and again is with the writers I've worked with, they, they'll say, oh, well, you know, I thought I was going to write about this, and then I looked at the prompt and said, oh, I'm going to, and look what appeared. Mm -hmm. I'd say, wow, you know, you've just produced several thousand words of something really astonishing and wonderful and funny and poignant. And they say, yeah, I wasn't intending to write about this. Uh, and that's when, I, <laughs> that's when I become very happy because, and they become happy too, because this is literally their, their life story saying, this is where the energy is. This is, what, this is how the story wants to be told. And again, that links to the idea of the unconscious. Uh, because the story is waiting there, and it's, it's ready to come to the surface. And it might not quite be the story we thought it was going to be in our conscious minds. And so that's uh, an area, an area of great delight. I mean, it's it's surprising for the writers. It's uh, illuminating, and gradually, as these these fragments emerge, actually the story will tell you, in the biggest sense, what it is. And one will look at one's pages, and uh, you know, writers will gather and will say, well, what seem to be the themes here in the last five, six things you've written? And we'll brainstorm and say, well, there seems to be a theme of this, or you know, you keep mentioning this. And suddenly, for many of them, it's as though the lights go on and they say, oh, yes, that's actually the direction my story needs to take. So literally, we have to listen to our own lives. It's also fascinating to think about what writing your own memoir does. Now, you also talk about a, a writer's shelf. What exactly is that? And what does that do? Oh, yes, a writer's shelf. Well, it's, uh, that's designed uh, to, uh, to work on the unconscious. So uh, some people call it a, a, a writer's toolbox. My great colleague, colleague Bob Atwan actually calls it a writer's toolbox. But I call it a shelf because that's what I actually use. And what I mean by this is... Um, if I'm doing a writing project, uh, if, uh, for instance, when I was doing my, my father's memoir, which needed a lot of finishing, I began to put things uh, on a shelf where I could look at them, things that were connected with him. And you can do this for your own life. You can find, I don't know, uh, little mementos, little, little souvenirs, maybe... Um, train tickets or bus tickets or a picture or a postcard. Pictures are usually very, very good. And the idea of a shelf is you put them where you can see them just about every day and, and really look at them. Now, what this does is twofold. The first thing it does is, you know, you can't falsify and glamorize things, which is what we tend to do, um, whether we like it or not. 
You can't falsify things if you've got a picture of it right in front of you. Um, if you've got a picture of you, the house you were you were living in at the time, if you've got a picture of the the person down the road, um, then that reminds you of the physical actuality of the place. And it keeps you rooted, and as I say in the book, it keeps you honest with the facts. And this is important, because we're not really in the business of dramatizing everything or making ourselves look good. We're interested in chipping away through that and finding out what was. So the writer's shelf is really uh, useful for that. And I'll give you an example, which is on my writer's shelf when I was doing the work on my father's memoir, I had a little, a tiny little picture, which was of him um, in his basic training, flight training class. And there were you know, 16 people standing in front of what looks like these days a very ancient aeroplane, and uh, they're all smiling at the camera. And you know, this is the picture that had been on his dresser for 40 years. And I thought, well, you know, three here. So, so I put it on the writer's shelf. And what I learned from it by looking at it and asking questions such as, why this picture? Why so small? What does it show us? Um, some of that was quite a revelation. So, for instance, you know, the picture was very small because he had left uh, all his pictures of his of his uh, training days with his mother when he went off to, um, to fight in the Royal Air Force. And, and a bomb fell on the mother's house, and all the big pictures, because they were big, were destroyed. But the little ones sort of fluttered around in the street and mm -hmm. down the road and were picked up and saved. So you know that little picture is of itself a sort of miraculous survivor. And then when you apply that back to actually the picture of these 16 young men all smiling into the camera, what you realize is that of those 16 young men uh, in, in, in the spring of 1941, um, by two years later, only two of them would be alive. Mm -hmm. The rest would have been killed in action. And so every day he was looking at that picture and reminding, and it was my task, as it were, to get into that mindset so I could understand his life journey better. And, you know, I could go on and on about this picture because there are other things in it as well. But this is just one example of a little piece of information that yielded many stories. Now, um, what about pictures and photographs? Is that something that a person could also add to their memoir as well? Yes, yes. Uh, pictures and photographs can be enormously revealing. Um, one of the exercises I have is, I say, uh, you know, find a picture of yourself at the age of four or five and take a look at it. I think, well, four or five, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not much of an age right there, except it, it, it is really because at, at four and five years old, you know an awful lot about the family. You know mm -hmm. who you like and who you don't like. You know who you can manipulate and who you can't. You know who's kind, who isn't. It's just that at four or five, you probably can't uh, verbalize it. And so as, as I've done this exercise with um, many writers, uh, the riches that have emerged have just been enormous as they've remembered. Sometimes they've said, yes, I remember the day. I remember what they made me do and how much I disliked it. And I thought, gosh, you know, there, right there is a story about a family that wanted things to look good but didn't care if the if the child, in this case herself, was feeling very uncomfortable and resentful. And so from these little clues, these little diamond twinklings in the dust, as it were, we can construct really important things about the family that shaped each of us at a time when we were too young to do much else apart from respond to their shaping pressures. So photographs can be just astonishing. And, you know, of course, we've all had the experience of looking at a photograph of ourselves uh, 
20 years ago and saying, good gracious, did I ever wear those clothes? You know, mm -hmm. Did I ever have a haircut like that? <laughs> and we look at the picture and we go, oh, yes, oh, my. And that keeps us a little bit humble sometimes. <laughs> and it reminds us of just how odd those times must seem to anyone who wasn't there. So, yes, I, I think photographs are a, just a treasure trove of good um, material memories, and ju they just spark one's uh, responses. So now, um, as a person gets started, what do you suggest how they get started, where to begin? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, I do um, tend to uh, suggest that they start with the photograph exercise. Um, that's usually a pretty good place to ask uh, to, to start, uh, and it, it rarely fails. Sometimes you can, if you have people who don't like um, photographs or who, who don't have them, sometimes it's a good way to just to start, just to say, well, okay, you know, um, sign your name, and they sign mm -hmm. their name, and I say, hey, okay, there, there's your name. Uh, what do you know about your name? And it's amazing how little people know about their names. Right. say, well, isn't it time we, we found out? I mean, I could ask that about you. Uh, I could say, well, you know, wh what, what do you know about your name? Do you know where it came from? Well, you know, it may be, it may be perhaps um, an Irish name. I don't know. Do you, do you know about your Irish forebears? Mm -hmm. um, or it may, in fact, be something entirely different, especially in this country where where many names were, were, were sort of Anglo-Saxonized. And so in some ways, it doesn't matter so much where one starts. The question is simply, you know, let's start, or the, or the proposition is let's start. But writing one's name like that and, you know, one's middle name, gosh, where did that come from? Hmm. There's often a family connection of some strength there, either loved or not loved. So the naming exercise can work very well. The photograph exercise can work extremely well. And a, a, another exercise that I sometimes have people do is I say, well, what's, what's the first address that you can remember as a child? What is the first address? Mm -hmm. And can you still remember the phone number? You know, <laughs> Right. And again, uh, sometimes <laughs> people say, yes, I can remember that one. I can't remember the next one or the next one. I can remember that first one. And remembering, often for the small child, is, um, is an empowering thing. Oh, I know where I live. I know my name and address and phone number. Mm -hmm. And so there's a little snapshot there, a little opening of the door that says, oh, if you can remember that, let's go a little deeper and find out what else you remember about this family that was bringing you up. Mm-hmm. Especially the old neighborhoods, the old friends. Yeah. So it's also good to kind of do a little sleuthing on your own uh, as you get started. You might find one thing leading to you to another, and before you know it, you're in a place you would have never expected or even remembered before. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And that's, you know, that's why the story uh, sort of takes over. It tells you where you need to go next. Um, it can be enormously rewarding. Sometimes people have said, well, um, I, I was adopted, and so I don't know the condition of my first five years, or I don't know what it was like. And yet when they say that, I'm always aware that they want to know. And so mm -hmm. it may take some sleuthing. It may take um, some inventiveness. It may reveal very little um, in, in actual terms, but in spiritual uh, terms that can be enormous. A, a, a lady who had been adopted and who could not remember, she simply could only remember tiny fragments of her life before the age of seven or eight. Uh, she came across the records where she had been uh, born and where her birth family had lived, and so she physically went there and asked around and put an ad in the local paper, and she got two responses to this ad. Mm -hmm. uh, people who said, oh, yeah, I remember seeing your mother wheeling uh, um, a stroller with someone in it. That must have been you. And she said, well, it wasn't much information, but the, the effect on her psyche was to say, 
okay, now I know this for sure. I was born in this neighborhood. I did live here. People saw us, and we, we have some sort of real existence. And psychologically, that was hugely consoling to her. It, you know, it was, um, it was very moving when she spoke about that. Mm-hmm. It also gave her a tremendous sense of somehow being more empowered than before, actually of, of mattering in, in a new way. So yes, the, the, the sleuthing can, can reveal extraordinary things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, as people do this, I know I sort of, I've asked this question sort of earlier, but what do they tend or how do they tend to respond to you as they're writing their memoir and how it changes them and what kind of change is that besides having really good personal peace? Well, uh, I do tell them at a certain point, I say, you know, writing like this is going to change you, and it will almost 100% change you for the better. Um, uh, because actually, I, I've never seen it not do that. Um, and sometimes people um, feel, oh, this is this is shaking my preconceptions, this is shaking my, my universe. And um, I've said to them, okay, well, you know, if you see these people from your life in in new ways and you want perhaps to build a few bridges that you burned before, you can try doing that. I say, but be gentle because the people that you're going to be approaching may not have been doing the same sort of work that you've been doing, personal work on the unconscious. So they may be surprised. They may be they may be afraid. Why are you Why are you coming to ask questions of them? Why are you asking them about this? And under those circumstances, my advice is, you know, they've spent however many years it is these these people in your life trying to trying to live their lives quietly or at least um, reasonably well. And maybe they've come to some compromises. They'd be very uncomfortable to to have unearthed, in which case your job, our job as fellow human beings is not to condemn them, not to criticize them, and certainly not to frighten them. Our job is just to say, gosh, look how hard life is for some people. Mm -hmm. Look how difficult it can be for some people under certain circumstances to be the best version of themselves they can be. You know, extend compassion, extend love, and extend respect as well. And this, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say that everybody uh, jumped up and down and were, and they were all joyous at learning the things that the writers have um, have uncovered. But it might not be the case. When we write our memoir, if we go deep, we may find that we change our relationship not only to the way we see the past but to the way we see the people in it. Certain people may get very anxious about that. They, they may be afraid that somehow they are not going to appear in a good light. Uh, well, I think one has to respect that. There are, certain, there are certain skeletons that probably don't need to be brought out of the, the closet and dusted off. And that perhaps is the difference between soul work, which you're doing for your soul, for your own sense of greater understanding, and um, what may happen with a public figure. You know, if a public figure like Sarah Palin writes her memoir, she's only too eager to make certain things appear certain ways. And mm-hmm. perhaps, um, you know, she's out to, because she's a politician, you know, right. <laughs> perhaps she's out to appear better or more right or more misunderstood. And, and, and that's fine, but let's not pretend that this is quite the same as what most people are doing when they decide, okay, I'm going to dig into my life and find out some of the things there that I really wasn't prepared to look at because I was maybe a little hasty a little judgmental. And so, yes, uh, one, one needs a lot of compassion and um, a lot of gentleness, I think. So it's interesting when we talk about our soul beginning to put its life on paper 
And as we were talking earlier about the fact that sometimes there are those hard things that come out that we're not so sure that we could put down because of maybe betraying other people, how do you kind of, I guess, overcome that barrier so it can just come out? You know, it's sort of like the old thing, you know, please don't discover my diary because I think you betrayed our relationship sort of a thing. <laughs> That's right. Please, please don't discover this diary, although I've left it on the dresser. <laughs> um, yes, well, there are the, this is a very real fear and a very common fear. And <clears throat> what I tend to say to people is <clears throat> actually, you know, if whilst you're in the class, you're writing for yourself. And if you wish to share it with the class, that's fine. But actually, you're writing for yourself. Later down the line, you may decide whether or not you want to publish it, and if so, whether you want to publish it just for your family members, or, or you know, go the the mega mega book sell route, or whatever it is you decide. But for now, let's just make sure we dig as deep as possible into this gold mine and bring up as much gold as possible. What each writer chooses to do with that is a private decision that comes a lot later. And some people, of course, say, well, you know, um, my parents are, are dead now, or these people aren't there, or I'm going to change this name, and, and that's great. That'll keep you out of trouble, and, and that's good. But in fact, this whole business of, oh, I can't write that because I might offend someone, that is actually one of the conscious minds, the ego's defenses, that is designed really to try and shut down the writing process. And that can lead to a pretty big writing block. Mm -hmm. So very often people say, oh, I can't say that because my, my brother-in-law might not like it. I say, well, you know, maybe we need to worry about that when when the agent is, is waving the contract with the sixth six-figure uh, advance uh, inked in. Maybe we need to worry about that, and then uh, uh, w only when that happens. And then, you know, you may want to change a few details or talk with a lawyer or whatever, but mm -hmm. let's not worry about that yet. We have much more work to do before we get to that point. So I say give yourself the space to tell it like, like it feels it needs to be told, to tell it as well as you can like it is and later worry about whether there is any offense going on. Uh, such an interesting thing. You would have never thought about writing a memoir to do the kind of cleansing in many ways that it does, while at the same time seeing your life from a different point of view. I mean, so many people kind of go through life when things are rough day in and day out, year after year, and think, oh, what a poor victim I am. But then all of a sudden I would think by something like this, they get to see how because of how they viewed life uh, through a filter, so so to speak, that they've created a lot of these circumstances, too. So I can see where this becomes very magical work. Oh, you're absolutely right. I, and, I, and I like the, that way you described it. I mean, we all carry filters around with us. And unfortunately, those filters are well-established, and we're very fond of them. And so we process information based on what we're expecting to be the case rather than perhaps what, what was the case. And uh, so removing those filters is a little bit like taking off one's dark glasses on a gloomy day. You suddenly realize, oh, there's much more light around the place. And uh, the, many of my writers have moved from a situation literally of victim status and said, oh, you know, I was a victim once, but I don't have to continue to be a victim unless I do it to myself. And that's what I, uh, I, I love about this work that I do. You know, it's so, it's so inspiring to see people becoming empowered, and each person in a, in a workshop who, who gets this inspires the others, and they begin to say, oh, right, there, there's, there's more possibility here. There's something very life-enhancing and affirming going on. And, you know, the word you used uh, was a wonderful word. You used the word cleansing. And it's exactly like that. We, we sweep out all that old garbage, and then we realize, oh, wait, it was old garbage, and we don't need to live with it anymore. We can now live a newer version of ourselves. I mean, your, your show, I love your show, it's Beyond 50, 
And I'm always saying to myself, yes, it's a, when you reach that point in life, maybe that's about the time when you can do a major reassessment and get rid of that old stuff. Mm-hmm. And so writing a memoir um, is a wonderful way of doing that cleansing and re- and affirming one's one's energy, one's power, one's wisdom for the next part of life. And that's mm-hmm. that's what our, our loved ones need us to be. They need us to be the best possible version of ourselves we can. They don't need us to be some old curmudgeon who's still smarting from the from the old perceived slights. They need someone a little more alive and well and active. So, you know, this is uh, this is work I think that really is is something we might all want to consider doing at least a little bit of. <laughs> Fascinating work here, the sole work of telling your story, write your own memoir. Now, is there a website people can go and find out more about how they can get started on this, suggestions and even oh, yeah. get a copy of the book? Yes, uh, you can go to my website, which is alanhunter.net, and that's a double l a n hunter dot net, uh, all one word um, for Alan Hunter. So that's my website where you'll see um, excerpts from the book and my other books. This is now my eighth book. Um, other books also have been about writing and self development, and it will link you directly to Amazon where um, the book is on sale, actually, because it's just come out. It's still at a substantial discount. Or if you prefer, you can go to the publisher direct, which is Findhorn, that's F-I-N-D-H-O-R-N, Findhorn Press, and their website is findhornpress, all one word, dot com. And uh, that'll direct you to the, uh, to the, you just type my name in, and um, it'll direct you to the web page, uh, for for well for all my books but also for the memoir book so it's very easily found uh, it should start to be in bookstores before Christmas which I'm very excited about because I think some of the some of the older people in our families could well enjoy uh, browsing through this and get some inspiration from it so it's it's fairly easily found. Well, it's certainly interesting because you really put responsibility into the driver's seat of the person who's got the pen rather than, as we mentioned earlier, in the realm of self-help where it's somebody whose personal strategies or self-enlightenment or discoveries were put on paper and you know made to fit the masses, so to speak, and then people get frustrated when they just don't work, and here's an opportunity that people can take to actually be in the driver's seat and shift it into fourth and just drive away. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly it. And that's my aim, is to put people back in in charge and say, okay, um, here you are. You've got, you've got some live, interesting stuff happening. This is how you may want to develop it. This is what you can expect to experience on the way. And there are, and I give quite a lot of guidance about you know there are there are several stages that every memoir writer goes through, and as long as we know they're coming, we can say, "Oh, okay, I'm now at this stage as I'm gathering my information, and I now know what to do with it." But I veritably believe that many of the self-help books out there, some of them, them are very good, but they are, as you, as you say, they they tend to put the reader into a passive situation. Mm-hmm. Follow my advice. And this is what happens. Uh, mm-hmm. And as we know, that doesn't have a huge success rate. Um, many many people report some success, but actually, I suspect the majority of people need to realize that they are in charge. And when they are in charge, it it becomes less like work. It becomes pleasure. Mm-hmm. And that's what my writers tell me. They say, "Oh, you know, the first the first week of of." setting up my my writing practice and turning up at the at the table or the desk. I said, the first week was hard, but now, they say, now, gosh, you know, I'm just eager to be there. And suddenly, we're not passive, we're back in charge. Mm-hmm. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to do for oneself. Well, it certainly is. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you here on the program because we seem to always, between us, bring up such tremendous enlightenment for people to <laughs> kind of go, wow, you know, I never really thought about it this way, and, and, it's, and it's simplicity, so to speak. And it's really how the heart speaks in the first place is through simplicity. 
Well, it's it's always a pleasure to be with you, Daniel, because you know you you are very you resonate extremely well with uh, with these things. I'm delighted to say, and um, so it makes it talking about it just a pleasure. It really does. Our guest today, for those tuning in, Dr. Alan Hunter. The book is Write Your Memoir, The Soul Work of Telling Your Story, and Everybody's Story Deserves to Be Told. And I want to thank you for being here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you again. You bet. Go ahead and give your website out again one more time. Okay. Um, www.alanhunter.net, and that's A-L-L-A-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, all one word, dot net. And... Um, that uh, don't go to dot com. That's some uh, soccer player who's uh, in New Zealand, uh, but that will get you direct to my my website, uh, and it will show you um, my books and what I do uh, in greater detail. So please um, check in with the website. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And likewise, thanks again. I want to also thank you, the listeners, for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I would also like to send out special thanks to the sponsors that have made this program possible. ZRT Laboratories, that's right, let in-home hormone testing be your guide to better wellness and well-being. We also want to thank uh, Tree, uh, Tree of Life Rejuvenation Center, that's right, you can get on their 21-day reversing diabetes program. Just simply log online to treeoflife.nu. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. Please be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50 with a 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. Also visit us at our blog where we archive our shows and have great resource information for you and people you know to use. Again, thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis, and remember, live your day past halfway.